not here this morning, I want to encourage you, please, on Shofar Stellenbosch Facebook page, if you are any, in any way interested to have a family one day, or you're part of a family, and you want to do a biblical family one day, or you want your family to be biblical, then I want you to listen to Mkasi Karsten's sermon this morning. He will blow you out of this world um, because of just, uh, you know, he made a powerful statement. He said, we are many times Christians living in a secular home. We don't have Christian biblical homes, and we need to trust the Lord to transform our homes, our families uh, into that place of being Christian. Really, what is Christian? And so tonight, I'm going to sort of add on, I didn't know that he was going to talk, take that specific angle, but as, as I was driving back from Mossel Bay or the Witsand, those places we did a, I did a wedding there yesterday. My hobbies are to do weddings over um, weekends, like the crayfish season opens up. It has opened up two weekends ago, because um, till the end of December, I'll probably do another eight weddings. So my wife and I, we drive all over the country. Uh, people say, oh, you eat nice. Yeah, yeah, and we drive nice as well. But what a privilege, you know, where Christoph and Pietro got married yesterday, and it was like this rural group of people that you really think like, whoa, you know. Um, and especially after, it's always shocking to see people, you know, now you come to this farming community, and then the first thing when people walk up and they see there's a guitar, somebody with a guitar, and there's singers in front, and you know, it's outside under the trees, then immediately people start to like, especially the older generation, you know, they're like, really? Then you're like, you know, I make jokes. I've pulled out my best Japanese drive over Chinese foot jokes, everything. After 20 minutes, nobody's laughing. Everybody's just staring. And I say, Lord, help. You know? <laughs> but I've learned you must put a renter crowd, take a renter crowd with you that will at least laugh at your jokes, you know, <laughs> to say, you know, you can have my... Uh, carrot cake later, all that stuff. Just eat all my pudding. I'll give it to you if you just love. Because sometimes, especially these um, very, very conservative communities, beautiful people that love the Lord, but they're very conservative. I grew up in a house like that, you know, where I thought, and many of you know the story, the, you know, my granddad always said to me, if you go to the happy clappies where they lift up their hands, and when you get baptized, I'm going to disinherit you. This is it. There's no way for you out once you get in. And I remember the first time going there in Paul, it was Paul Assemblies of God. And a friend of mine took me there. And when I walked in, I realized, like, this is it. This is it. These people wear shorts to church. They lift up their hands in this red curtain at the back. And they slaughter people there. I just knew it. And I thought, I'm going to be the next one. They brought me here to slaughter me, to kill me, to... Give me as an offering to their gods, you know. And the people, I remember just sweating, you know, life, living waters flooding from underneath my armpits, you know, the whole evening. And I still prayed. I said, God, if you take me alive out of this place, I will serve you for the rest of my life, you know. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, um, I realized like, wow, I, I, it was such a shock to me that there's another group of Christians out there that worship the Lord differently than my experience. And so all of us, the challenge for us when we come and we read the Bible, then maybe you didn't grow up in a conservative home, but you grew up in a more charismatic, like bands like this type of church. But all of us come and we bring baggage into the way we read scripture. We bring our culture and the most important thing is when you come to God, you must take off your cultural lenses and you must say, Lord, I want a biblical worldview. Because you can even be in a church like this that claps hands and jumps up, but your heart is far from God. It's just a religious, emotional experience. And so it is so important that we realize and when we look at the church in the West, the church in the West is dying. The church in the West is not alive. Because firstly, the homes are corrupt. There's not Christianity. is not a lifestyle. Christianity has become an event. Christianity has become an entertainment. And <clears throat> there's no discipleship anymore. And so one of the challenges for us as a church is we're trusting the Lord that within two years we will shift from just nice fellowship and community to really a disciple-making machine. And that may be that we will not meet like this anymore.
maybe in groups of 30 and stream in into homes. <clears throat> because the worst thing that can happen is that you think that this is church. This is just celebration of what God has done the whole week. And so the whole year we've been saying, I'm not going to church. I am the church. And what God is establishing in my life from and through my relationships. And I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm saying this is great. Corporate worship, going to the temple is amazing. But if we do it because we think that is church, we're in trouble. And so there's a massive shift in the, in the church just worldwide. They call it the global south. Most of the church that is growing and expanding, you won't read about it in the news, but are in the heart of China, in the heart of Iran, in the heart of Brasilia, Brazil. It's all, it's all Brasilia. Manifolia, you know, but in any case, so it's all moved south. They call it the global south. And if you go and study the church and the revival that is busy happening, it is amazing. It is just one group of people that is actually happening with, and it's called the charismatic movement. Now, there's a lot of isms on the side, and one must be very careful for that because there's a lot of negative stuff as well. So I, I, I'm not, I don't like stuff that comes out of America. I must confess, sorry, American people, you know, especially American TV. I don't watch American TV. There's, there's very few people that I will watch because a lot of that is like entertainment orientated. But when we get into scripture and we realize like what is our true biblical inheritance? So I'm talking about Pentecost tonight and I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. Something very important that we understand that it's not the experience, but the thing that makes the church flourish is our relationship with the Holy Spirit. The thing that makes the church be healthy is where the Holy Spirit is in complete control, if I can use the word control, of our lives. It's not because I'm going to an event or because I'm going to small group or because I'm listening to that guy's ser sermon. It's Jesus made certain promises and that promise is for you and me. And it means that culturally we need to shift sometimes because if you do not experience the Holy Spirit tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, every day of your life, then maybe just experiencing the Holy Spirit on Sunday is not the real Holy Spirit. It's maybe just your own emotions. And a lot of people are psyching themselves up. But the amazing thing is just go and read of what God is doing in Iran. Go and read of what God is doing. God is moving and he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. He, he promised that. So God is raising up a generation of people that says, hey, we look at this world and we are tired of the things of this world. We're tired of entertainment. We want the real deal. <laughs> and so in Acts, listen to this, what, what Jesus promised. And he brought the disciples together, and this is his promise. Very simple, he says, and being assembled together with him, he can commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus gives a command. Have you realized it's not a suggestion? <laughs> the Bible most of the time does not talk in suggestions. Why? Because... The outflow of true discipleship in church is obedient disciples, okay? So the main thing that we want to teach people in church is how do I hear the voice of God and how do I become obedient to what God has told me? That's really accountability. Accountability isn't about, hey, let's check up on each other's sins. Real accountability is when I come to you and I come to Remo and I say, Remo, that thing that God has spoken to you about, how can I help you to become more obedient to it? How can I help you to celebrate what God is doing? And how can I encourage you to become who Christ and what Christ has called you to be? Are, are you with me? So obedience is the difference between a consumer church and a Holy Spirit-led discipleship church. I mean, okay. And that's, that's what you should ask. When you come to church tonight, you mustn't just sit there and think like, oh, yeah, yeah. So if you don't bring a pen and a paper, you've already lost 40%. If you don't write down and go back home and say, God, what are you speaking to me? You know, I remember preaching one day and I really felt ba bad because I was, um, I, I, just one of those days, I was just a bit out of it. And so I preached and I actually forgot to share the punchline of the sermon, where I was going, you know. So I shared like 80% and then I just stopped and prayed for people and we went home. And that night I felt so bad. I thought like, oh. 
Oh, Lord, I've missed you completely, Lord. It's completely out of this world. I have no idea, God. I've missed you, and I repented for three days. So that Wednesday, I thought, like, I'm going to go visit um, this one small group. It was still Alistair Kingwell. Now, he's the pastor in Shofar Bloemfontein today. He was still a student then. So I went to visit the small group because I was the zone leader there, and I was like, and I was so tense. I thought, like, I've missed God so completely because what I felt God said, I must say, I didn't say it. I actually got a bit rabbit trailed all over the show, you know. And so now they're beginning to share. The small group is beginning to share on the sermon of the last Sunday evening. And so the one, the first guy starts and he says, do you know what? There was this part, but Monday I actually went home and then the Holy Spirit told me this and this and this. And then the other guy says, no, 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 but the Holy Spirit told me this thing and added this and said, but that's it. And so... Eventually, within 20 minutes, they were talking about everything God told them that I missed, that I didn't speak about in the sermon. I thought like, okay, Lord, you are really building your church. (laughs) I was so relieved. For the first time, I got this revelation that the Holy Spirit actually works in every believer that is hungry for God because he's the spirit of truth. And so... So it is amazing. I I can tell you so many testimonies of God's working in people's lives. You know, one testimony that just comes to mind is one day, and um, we were, I was preaching in in Stellenbosch High School, and and sometimes the Lord tells me, I call somebody and and tell somebody they must come now, you know? It's called the word of knowledge. And so so I had this word of knowledge, and this guy, you know, and and I really felt like, this is what God is saying. So, so I'm not going to share the details about that. But I said, there's a guy here that's struggling with this. The Lord has been speaking to you about this. Da, 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 da. And I was going on. And I said, you must come to the front now because I, I want to pray for you. And so there's this awkward moment. Until death do us part. Death did come and almost parted me because I felt like, okay. So the guy didn't respond. But I actually spoke and I, for three times I said, no, I'm, I'm serious. I, I believe this guy's listening right now. You, you, you need to respond right now. Nobody responds. You know, I, I felt like, Lord, who was that Amalekites where you opened up the earth and swallowed them up in the Old Testament? Lord, swallow me up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Lord, this is, this is so awkward because everybody was just sitting there. So I went home that evening and I cried before God. I said, God, I'm missing you completely. I I, I was so sure. I was 100% sure that that was a word from you. I've I've never felt so sure like that. And Well, obviously, maybe the God didn't respond or what. Now I'm going through my mind. is going overdrive. And the Lord says, just be at peace. Just, Just stay. Just trust me. Exactly six months later, I got a phone call from a guy in London. And the guy said to me, he was actually a student here at Stellenbosch and then he went to work there. He says, do you know what? I backslid completely. I walked away from Jesus completely. But last night I had a dream. And in that dream, I dreamt that I must go and watch a sermon that you preached six months ago. But I mustn't listen to the whole sermon. I must go to 42 minutes and 10 seconds. That's where I must start. There was somebody that, there was a voice that told me, 42 minutes and 10 seconds. That's where I must start listening to the sermon. So then he went there and he found it on, online, went to 42 minutes, 10 seconds. And that was the moment when I shared that word that I was so embarrassed about in church. Exactly to the condition that was happening in his life. He fell on his face, started to cry, started to weep. Gave his heart to the Lord again. The next day he phoned me and says, do you know what? That word was so amazing. It changed my life forever. So much specifics that I never dreamed would be possible. Now, isn't, isn't God amazing? I mean, I thought like, whoa, Lord, do it again. Embarrass me again. You know? <laughs> that moment was like awkward. But the crazy thing is, is Jesus commands them and says, look, here, I've got something in store. But the context wasn't easy. The context was sending the disciples back to the place where they crucified him. The context was sending the disciples into the fear of dying. It says, I command you, go up there to the Jerusalem, the place where they crucified, they crucified me outside of Jerusalem. Go up there and wait for the promise to come. The promise from the Father, the one that I've been speaking about all the time, the Holy Spirit. 
go up there and he'll come there. My first reaction would have been like, no, 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 no. Jesus, do you know how dangerous it is over there? <laughs> Galilee, Galilee would make such a better song, you know. Galilee, da, 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 you know. Galilee, the word Galilee and, or Nazareth is just such a nicer word or Capernaum, you know. It just use any other city. Why do you send us back to Jerusalem? <laughs> why, why go back there? 500 people standing there. Do you know only, only 120 made it to the upper room? 380 were trapped by fear. So where we start when we talk about the Holy Spirit, and this is where the modern day charismatic people miss it completely. We put the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to comfort and to a nice experience. And that is exactly where the Holy Spirit was not sent to. Not to create a comfortable, comfortable nice experience. God sent them straight back into their fear. Straight back into the place of dying. Straight back into the place where. And that's why when Jesus even appeared to them, the Bible says the doors were locked. They were so afraid. <laughs> it wasn't like this is an easy, nice place, you know. And so, so I get a bit uncomfortable when people talk about, oh, the Holy Spirit, you know. My, my buddy, you know, my, no, 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 you know. I think like, and so a lot of people today, and, and I, I want to I just sort of help us a little bit because I'm challenged a lot by that. A lot of people just say today, no, the Lord spoke to me. The Lord said to me. I think like, okay. What is like a biblical example for the Lord speaking to you? Is Well, firstly, does everybody around you that know you very well agree with what God has spoken to you about? But sometimes we say too easily, oh, the Lord spoke to me because hey, it creates escapism for our fear. Oh, let's make it a bit more personal. How many people like, this guy goes and he says, lady, I, I really like you. No, no, it's not my season for dating. What? The Lord spoke to me clearly. How did he speak to you? No, no, in my heart. He gave me peace. Do you know, primarily God does not. <laughs> I mean, somebody said, I mean, and just looked at somebody else. I thought like, okay, let me just get it away from that crowd that said, I mean, so loudly. Just go to this side, yeah? We don't, as Christians, we primarily do not define our, whether God has spoken to us by peace primarily. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind we say well i've got peace about it or i don't have peace about it but you don't guide whether god has spoken to you through emotions primarily you look at the word and if there's anything that disagree with the word and i was i was skyping this one group of people students that left here they're busy with the church plant somewhere in a very racial environment where there's a lot of racists and a lot of people and they're talking to me about all the issues. And I says, no, no, they want to just change the stuff. So I says, well, what does scripture say? Before, he says, no, you just wants to pray. I say, no, you don't pray. There's certain stuff you don't pray about. I said, you don't, the Bible says, don't throw new wine into old wineskins. So you want to pray about something which scripture is already clear about. Certain stuff you don't need to pray about. You just follow God because he already said that. Now, now a lot of charismatic people don't like that because we want to feel, oh, you know, drink tea with the angel at quarter past four in the afternoon, you know, because they've always visited the past at four o'clock and quarter past four, that, my door, you know. But the word should guide us. And this is what Jesus talks about. He says, therefore, verse 6, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, what will you at this time restore to the kingdom of Israel? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? So they are completely in another thing. So, so they are full of fear. They want to run away. And they say, okay, Lord, we'll make a deal with you. If we get up to Jerusalem, where well, you're going to pour out the Holy Spirit now, are you gonna are you gonna be, bring the kingdom down? Because we want the kingdom to come now. We want you to wipe out all these Romans. We want you to bring lightning. We want you to sort them out. Are you gonna restore it right now? And then Jesus says, and he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons 
which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the power is not to overthrow the Romans. The power is the dunamus power, because that's what the word power talks about. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Very romantic. It sounds very romantic. But if you look at church history and what happened after that, they received power. But most of the time, it was completely out of their comfort zone. Eventually, AD 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed, fell to the ground. Many of them scattered. They ran for their lives. Because I've, I've got news for you and me. If we want to follow God, there's one thing God is not interested in. Your comfort zone. That's the story of the Bible. God is not interested in our comfort zone. I have a friend that always says like, well, that's why he sent the comforter. Because the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. It means you're going to be out of your comfort zone all the time. And that's why you need a comforter. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but we want to sort of create this holy space in our lives, and then we say, oh, oh Lord, Lord, come and bless me where I am right now. And the Lord says, the only way that you're going to grow is if I take you out of your comfort zone. So the story of the book of Acts is a crazy story. Because now they receive the Holy Spirit. Only 120 actually become obedient and follow the command. They conquer their fears by going up there. They lock the doors. They stand there. And now, now they're waiting. God says, oh, oh, there's a promise. And you know, a lot of Christians today, we don't have a promise. You have to hang on to the word of God, the promises that God has given you. Because those promises are going to be tested. What did God speak to you? What did he say to you? What, 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 what does he want to do in your family and through your family? Yo. And as you become obedient, what begins to happen is he begins to stir stuff in your life. And you say, yes, Lord, that's the most amazing thing ever. Wow. The promise. He promised it in a lot of other scriptures. John 7 verse 37, talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, on that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. If your relationship and my relationship, and I'm mainly talking to people with the charismatic view if it is just to quench your thirst then we are quenching the holy spirit because every promise jesus gave about the holy spirit he says out of your heart will flow rivers of living waters he says come you come and come and drink from the waters come if you're thirsty come to me he says but once you start to drink of that water you're never going to thirst again but more than that if it's a true Holy Spirit experience, it will become a fountain that springs up out of your life. And it's not a true Holy Spirit in our lives if there's not a fountain that flows out of once you started to drink of that water. Come, you'll receive power and then you will be my witnesses. He doesn't talk about doing witnessing. He talks about who you become. Out of you, will life will come. Life will start to flow because that's, God's call and his invitation for your and my life. Now, most people say today, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm not into this stuff. It's too spooky for me. I'm not talking about being weird tonight. I'm talking about the inheritance of the church. What makes the church? What was the promise of the church, of the early church? Was the promise of the Holy Spirit. Was the promise of living waters. It's getting very quiet here tonight, but hallelujah, lock the doors. In here, lock the doors. Insia, Insia, lock the doors. Okay? You, all of you, lock the doors. Videos? Okay. Listen to this. John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and I will give you another help. He says, I'm going to help you. That he may abide with you on Sundays. No, 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 no. He's going to abide with you on Wednesdays. Whew, that's holy day. I don't believe in church anymore, but Wednesdays is my they, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you 
know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The greatest challenge to Jesus' ministry, remember the name of Jesus means savior, Christ means anointed one. The one filled with the Holy Spirit, the one full of the Holy Spirit, ministering in the Holy Spirit. And scripture says very clearly that the greatest challenge will come. The world cannot see him, cannot see the Holy Spirit, cannot recognize the Holy Spirit. And that's why the greatest challenge to Jesus' ministry wasn't the unbelievers, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees. People that apply the letter to the law. The, this is like, this is what I must do. And it's all about your performance and my performance and how good we become Christians. While the call of true Christianity of the first church was, come and surrender. I'm going to give you grace. Grace means enablement. Don't perform. Leave your performance. You can't do it. That's why I told you the story of me preaching and not finishing the sermon. Or having a word of knowledge and I've got no clue. I'm just obedient. And then God does the rest. Why? Because suddenly I realize there's another relationship. He's my helper. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead me, doesn't control me, but he comes alongside me. The world is going to, if you really operate in the fullness of God and in the Holy Spirit, the world will hate you. And this is for me the benchmark of whether you really follow God or not. Is there any opposition to your Christianity? If not, just say, say to the Lord, Lord, I want to follow you. <laughs> then all hell will break loose. Anyone can testify of that? Raise your hand. Anyone can say like, once a time I put up my hand and then, ooh, you know? It's called the anti-Christ spirit. It's not the anti-Jesus spirit. The devil love people going to church. The devil love you to be religious. The devil has got no problem with you reading your Bible and quoting scripture every day. But you just start to live that scripture and see how the world comes against you. There's not one example of people in scripture following God where there were not great opposition. And what happens through that opposition is there's an opportunity for you to discover how big your God is. It's not an opportunity to come against the devil. It's an opportunity to know how big God is. Yeah, John 15, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, you will testify of me and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. There's a guy who wrote it in much more better English. He said the following, the truth of God being the truth, being of infinite value, is worthy of infinite passion. Once you've discovered who God is, you'll become passionate about it because there's nothing else that you want. Nothing else that you want. But the devil robs us through consumerism and comfort to just say, hey, be busy, be distracted. There's, there's really not, God is really boring, you know. This church thing is really not for me. I've got so many other things to do, you know. Life is really fun out there. God is actually a spoil sport. And that's the biggest lie you can ever believe. It's actually denying who God has made you. And that call and that invitation. Living waters. <laughs> Living waters. <laughs> I remember sitting in a country one day where um, we thought we were going to die, okay? So... We were driving at this one place and they, just in that one week, I think 22 bombs went off in the city that we were. So now we're driving and, and this, this pastor tells us all these testimonies of, you know, how they wanted confirmation. And for some churches, it, for some people, it's just different than others, you know. So I, I told this testimony again before, but I'm going to tell it again. So this pastor friend, there were four friends, they're driving in, in the Karachi in Pakistan. And so they said, Lord, we want confirmation that we are called to this nation. So that evening, late night, they come back from arranging this outreach thing and they drive, they, uh, a car comes behind them, a bus before them and another bucky and two people with machine guns just jump out, about 12 guys with machine guns and started to open up fire on the car. They just, four of them, best friends in a car, following Jesus fully. And so the first bullets come through the windscreen, shatters the windscreen, 
And it is, do, 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 do. so he closes his eyes and he thinks like, wow, I don't feel anything and I'm in heaven now. Only problem is I'm still hearing all the stuff, you know, and he feels the shattering of the stuff. And eventually they just round out, they shoot out all the stuff in the AK-47s, 12 guys just shooting at them, jumping into the cars, driving off again. And so he thinks like, this is quite strange. I'm in heaven, but I, I still feel like I'm here, you know. And then you look at the car, the car is almost gone. All the, the top part of the car has been shot to pieces. Even the gear lever between the two of them is gone, but not one of them, anything, anything happened to them, not, not nothing. So he says, thank you, Lord, for our confirmation that we should be here. Most of us would not like that type of confirmation. I mean, <laughs> think like, no, 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 Lord, Lord, rather send the angel. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. The car was shot to pieces, and here the four of them sit, and they just begin to laugh. They say, okay, Lord, now we truly believe life and death is in your hands. So what's the promise? The promise of the Holy Spirit, the helper that would come. And then when we look at this, what happened next was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I'm, maybe what I'm saying tonight is, is already old news for you. Maybe it's just, but I'm making a declaration. Making a declaration over us as a church. Because there's so many people that are even excited about the charismatic experience, but they're not hungry for the Holy Spirit. And our inheritance is what we read in the book of Acts. It's not an intellectual experience with God. Everything these guys experienced were completely out of their comfort zone. So in Acts chapter 2, in verse 5, and there were, oh, previous one in verse, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now Pentecost was the feast of the harvest. So God sends them to Jerusalem out of their comfort zone to the place of harvest. Because every Jew and every different type of Jew were gathered for the feast of Pentecost. There were certain feasts that every Jew had to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate. It was just compulsory. And so God decides that when he sends his Holy Spirit, it was never about the 120. It was never about their experience. It was about the gospel that would go forth. It was about the going into the world. Because here is this opportunity where every tribe from the Jewish tribes were gathered. Everyone. The Greeks, the Persians, the Hellenists. Every Jewish culture was right there. So the other thing is if you want to know if something is authentic, if it's really the Holy Spirit, it will never be just a group. It will not just be oh, all the white Afrikaner people, or all the black People that has a rhythm, it's just on them. Or all the blue people, all the people that are 50 years old. Whenever the Holy Spirit comes, it has no, it's got no compartments. Are, are, are you with me? Because that's where God sends his Holy Spirit. And so, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each one of them, each one of them, not just some. Everyone that were there that were obedient, they had a promise and they were waiting for that promise. And here comes the Holy Spirit and they were all filled. Not just some were filled because there's a big group of Christians all over the world and we love them. We have got nothing against them, but they are cessationists. And so what they say is the Holy Spirit has died. The gifts are not there anymore. God only speaks through scripture. And that is not biblical. We love them and it doesn't mean that they're not going to go to heaven, but yeah, everyone, ordinary people, everyone received the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance, not as they gave themselves utterance. The Holy Spirit moved upon them and the Holy Spirit started to do things in their hearts. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Every nation under heaven. Say every nation under heaven. Every nation were right there. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So they hear, they just drinking, they're doing barbecuing and they're sitting out in the streets and they're just having a nice time. And suddenly they hear this massive sound. So they realize like, we are a bit confused. What is going on here? And so they go to the place where they heard the sound come. They were all amazed and marveled. Say amazed marveled okay 
any marvels here, any person with the name of marvel, but saying to one another, look, are not all those who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? Isn't this crazy? <laughs> they were all amazed. They were perplexed. Verse 12, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. It's, it's, it's not an add-on to the gospel. He says in the last days, this is what's going to happen. This is the promise. Dreams, visions, God's invitation to the supernatural. But you must also realize when it comes, it's not in a comfort zone because the Bible says some of them marveled, others mocked. Others just said, that's not for me. Because I don't understand it, it means I'm not going to engage it. It must be weird. And because maybe it is weird, it means like I'm going to just write it off. Because you know what? I've got all this intellectual pride. I'm actually putting myself in a place where I judge the movement of God. And so it is so important that we see the reaction because some mocked, some were amazed, some were perplexed, some were confused. Some looked like they were even drunk. So when God starts to move in your life, it doesn't always look comfortable. It doesn't always look neat. It doesn't always look nice. <laughs> but there's this whole lie in the church that says when God does stuff, it must fit into my way of thinking. And if God does not come to do it in my way of thinking, if I'm not in control, it's not God. I'm going to shift it off. And then so many people miss the Lord. So many people miss what God has for their lives. Because I want to tell you, God wants to speak to you in a vision and in a dream. You know, going to India, this one day we, we came to this place and met this little lady. She's 75 years old and she prays through the night. She wakes up at 12 and then she prays till 7. That's her prayer hours, 7 hours. So she just sits there and she has this heap of beans. She just takes the beans and then she puts it onto that little heap. And as she does that, just in that rhythm, she starts to pray and she prays. So we arrive there on the east coast of India and the lady says, oh, yo, yo, you. And she mentions my name and I think like she can't even speak English. And I think like, whoa. And then she begins to talk to us. We were, we were 14. The, the team started to be 14, but we were only 13 because one guy did an A3, okay, stayed behind and just continued what he started, the good work, you know, of studying. And so she begins to talk to us and she says, no, no, the Lord showed her all the faces of the whole team. She says, but she only has a problem. She, the Lord showed her 14 faces and there's only 13 people here. And then she starts to describe the guy who's still sitting at home. And then we realize like, this auntie can pray. <laughs> you know? She pulls the fire and she will pull your fire. You know? <laughs> so I repented all the way. I just said, Lord, don't show her all, all, the, all the sins in my life. You know? <laughs> Now, I have a mother-in-law like that, you know. The first time I went, but this is just between the two of us, okay. But she's a great lady, okay. So, the first time we go home or to go and visit. Now, Louise and I, we just married. We come back from the honeymoon and all that stuff. And then she comes and she says, I just want to talk to you quickly. And I say, okay, Lord, help me here. Okay. And she says, there's five things that you were praying about. Five things that you're busy praying about. And the Lord says the middle two. Now, the third and the fourth one, it's vanity. It's vain praise. He's not going to answer you in that prayer. You need to repent of that. But the fifth one, he's heard your heart. You know, and I'm thinking like, oh, my God. This mother of mine, mother-in-law, she's got a, a, a line up to heaven, you yeah? know. I went, I drove home. I said, Lord, please speak to me directly next time. Lord, I'll repent. I'll repent if you speak to me. <laughs> she's a beautiful lady because she prays, you know. And it, but it's just amazing when you can lock into that place of knowing God speaking. It's not weird, but part of the reaction was like some people mocked. Some people just made nothing of it. Some people just walked away. Some people just like said, hey, these people are all drunk. Look at them. This is too weird for us. 
And yet the, the, the invitation is to so much more. But the invitation is not to a supernatural experience. The invitation is to know Jesus. To have a helper. And Pentecost came and it changed the world. Within two years, this group of believers, without any internet, without any faxes, without any whatever, without any boats, without any stuff to just, or airplanes, within two years, the whole Asia Minor heard the gospel. Every household. Because of the working of the Holy Spirit. And you know, there's a lot of people that are drawing away from that, and especially in South Africa, there's a lot of people that are not talking about these things because they say, look, yeah, there's some weird stuff out there, and I totally agree. I, you know, I, I remember one day going to this place, and there was this pastor that he played the organ, the oil, you know, when he starts to preach. And doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, I'm thinking, like, what is this guy doing, you know? And he sweats, but then he always, like, wipes his, you know, don't worry, Jason, he is a Nigerian. But so, you know, so he sweats like this, then he goes like this. And then I thought like, oh, so he comes to the front and he says, and I stand there and then he tries to push me over. And I just thought, I'm going to resist. So I was standing there and I was standing there and, and he would try to, and I said, I am not going to be pushed over in Jesus' name. And I just stood there, you know. So I've experienced a lot of weird stuff and a lot of flaky stuff and a lot of, but that does not say anything about what Scripture says about the life in abundance that God has called you and me to. But you know, for many people, and especially people that are more intellectual, we, we just want to manage our lives. We want to control our lives. We, we want to control the outcomes because especially if you are hurt and you've been hurt through relationship, then what begins to happen is we become masters at control. And we don't engage because we are many times then motivated by fear. But you're in a good place tonight. If there's only one thing you forget, one thing you remember, <laughs> one thing you forget, <laughs> one thing you remember is right in the middle of that fear, that's where God wants to take control. Right in the middle, with, in that moment of desperation where you say, like, I can't, Lord, in relationships, I'm a failure. Lord, in this area of my studies, I'm a failure. That's where God wants you to surrender. Because he's called you to a life of knowing how dependent you are upon him. It's not about your comfort zone. It's not about your perfection. It's not about your performance. And that is what grace means. Grace means enablement to do the will of God. You are not supposed to be able to do what God has called you to do. Otherwise, we would never need him. And yes, we become obedient. Yes, we, we say, God, I, I want the fullness. I want the sound of heaven in my life. I, I, I want to walk in this place, Lord, that one day I don't have 50 buildings and 70 this and 80 that. Lord, I, I, want, I want you to move. So last Sunday morning, you know, there's a couple after the service. Um, Johnny and his wife preach here the morning, and so we were praying, Lord, just divine, just connect with people. You, you draw people, draw people to this place that must hear this message. Some of you have been drawn here by God. You think you came by yourself? God actually drew, drew you here. God even placed his eyes in your life. So this couple comes. I'm not going to give a lot of detail, but they have been separated for two years. They've never been in church here with us, an older couple. One is living overseas. One is living here in the Western Cape somewhere. The guy came back for the last time to work out his divorce papers with her. He said he's never going to come, come again. In the week while they were meeting, somebody told them, before you make a final decision, you need to go to Shofar Stellenbosch. You need to, you need to go to that church. Because they say they're Christian, and so they want to follow God. But this guy's already got in his mind divorce. Divorce, that's it. They've been separated. They're not living together for two years. So in the service, they come. They actually don't find the place. They miss half of the service. They, at the end of the service, they walk in here at the back. <laughs> here, um, Johnny comes to stand up. He says, marriage is a covenant. Until death do us part. And he begins to preach. He goes off. He goes to preach at the African service. And here comes the couple. And they both look at each other, they look at me, they say, 
God has drawn us here to hear this message. We're not going to divorce. In the week, they drive through to their mornings, go and see whom John Ethan did the list. Wow. What a testimony. Is it a coincidence? No, there's no coincidences with God. <laughs> but do you believe what you pray? Do you believe what you pray? How big is God? But I also want to say he's bigger than our comfort zones. He's bigger than our control. And that's why it always starts with you and me with the invitation. He says, come. come. I, I, I want to give you water, but I want that water to become a living stream. I want it to overflow. But we will never see revival when we want to control. We will, when we want to get legalistic. When we focus on all the periphery stuff and we don't focus on what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our midst. And, and so we must sometimes just say, hey, hey, sometimes we don't need even a band. Sometimes we just need to be still. Don't think that the band does anything to make the Holy Spirit feel welcome. That, that's not worship. That's not worship. Because if you worship in the week, God is with you. When you come here, it's just a celebration. My greatest desire, let, if I can just say this, just between the two of, two of you, my greatest desire is that when you come to church, you'll already know what the sermon will be about. There is a lady here. She works here in a guest house. She's an older lady. I don't know. It's, I think 65, 70. She's been with us since the beginning, since when Shofar started here in a little home outside of Stellenbosch. Five people, five to seven people. She was here from the beginning. And Shofar started very radically here because there was a black guy married to a white lady pre-apartheid being called by God to come to Stellenbosch. Many of you don't know the history of this church, but what started to happen is when all the <clears throat> more traditional people found out that there is these group of people that are radical for Jesus that actually pray coming to the heart of apartheid to establish a church to just pray. They didn't come here to establish a church. They just came to pray. Many times, bricks were thrown through the windows. Many times, they had to almost flee for their lives. Many times, the vehicles were scratched on. People mocked. People said, and then one time, there was a group of leaders from this town, very traditional people, that sat the leaders of this church down and said, you will not make it in this town. We will work you out of this town. It's now almost 30 years later. Not one of those leaders are around anymore. The church, still here. Because if the Holy Spirit births something in your life, it will stand. And so that's part of that inheritance is a group of people that cry out to say, God, we don't just want to be normal Christians. We have an urgency. We live with intention. And our lives will look different than what the world looks. Why is the church in South Africa falling apart? Because of com compromise and comfort. Nobody has a voice anymore. Nobody wants to stand up and say, hey, you're going crazy. You're changing the word of God. And the moment when you start to change the word of God, the moment when you start to change the family structure, we are in trouble as a nation. No, no, but we're just liberal. The culture of the day has changed. No, nothing has changed. Jesus doesn't change. And so tonight is God's invitation to you and me not to try and box him into what we understand, but to say, okay, Lord, we want to follow you. And it's a crazy road. Somebody's going to change. And do you know who that is? You! <laughs> me! <laughs> That's part of life. Hey, Chris, I'm ready for that. It is so simple, but so profound. Let me tell you one funny story and then one serious story and we're ending. Because we're way over our time, but the doors are locked. Hallelujah, okay? Some people you don't want to study, so we'll just keep them here a little bit longer, okay? You know, if, you, if you're out of your comfort zone, so <laughs> it's a funny story. It's, it's amazing. Okay, but so in any case, we're driving with this little bus. So it's a high ace. 
It's called a sihaya, you know, and so we didn't have any trailers or any stuff. But so what happens is we want to go on a mission trip. That's in 1996. Most of you were not even born then. We're a bunch of crazy students here from the church, 22 people. I'm 19 years old and, and, and the Lord says, you're going to lead the team. The oldest person on the team is 32. I'm the youngest person on the team and the Holy Spirit says, you're going to lead the team. I've denied, I, I sort of rejected the word of God for three months and then eventually I surrendered. Okay, so here we go with these two little Toyota buses up here to Malawi. So, so what happens is we don't have any money to actually even afford renting a bus. But so the university comes out and says they're putting a lot of their buses on tender. So what happens is you have to tender for it and then you come, you know, after a month, you have to pay for the bus. So we thought like, what a great idea. We're going to tender. So we get together and we say, okay, Lord, show us what amount we must tender for this bus because we want this bus and um, so that we can drive up. We have no money. We have no cent. We have, no, we have nothing in the bank, okay? So the Lord gives us a number. We all come in agreement. We put in the tender for these two buses. And after two weeks, they come back to us and say, you have the buses. You won the tender. So now we start to laugh. Because you know? the plan is get the tender, drive with the buses on the mission trip, come back, sell the buses. Hallelujah. So, so why should you pay for something if, you know? So here we have the buses. Now we drive up. Now we get there and the pastor is very excited. So here, late in the evening, I drive with one of these buses with four of the pastors. So we drive and we go up and down. Now we're going to the next village to go and tell them that we're going to do outreaches there. So in the back of the mind is we need to pay these buses. We need to get these buses back in South Africa. So here we're driving. We're going up and down. The next moment as we come, but it's a little gravel roads. Very it's still got a, a grass in the middle of the two tire tracks. So as we're driving, here we see a rabbit in the middle of the road. And so I go and I, and the next moment these pastors just go bananas, you know, they're just like, whoa, 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 whoa. and I think, like, what, what, you know, and whoops, whoops, gone is the rabbit. So Pastor Billy, Billy McConya is a good friend of mine, so he says to me, no, Pastor Sai as let me tell you, the bus is used for the two purposes. The one for the driving and the other one for killing the rabbit. And I'm thinking, oh, no, this is my worst fear. So he says, this is how you do it. You drive, you bright, dim, bright, dim when you see the rabbit. And then you just like, you know, drive over the rabbit. Okay. So I'm praying, Lord, let all the rabbits in North Malawi disappear tonight. Yeah. Just, just let them not. So here we drive it. I've got in the back of my mind, oh, Khuna. I don't, you know, these rabbits, and the next moment we come around the corner, and there is my Vranti war, okay? My Vranti war, okay? My truth war, you know? There's a rabbit there. And I'm beginning to think like, and here I put petrol on the pedal, and here we go. And the, the rabbit runs, and the rabbit gets confused, you know? And I'm completely out of my comfort zone. I'm just praying out loud in tongues, say, Lord, this is it. This is the end of my life. Lord, I'm not going to go back with half a bus, okay, and a rabbit and half a bus, you know. So eventually the rabbit goes into the grass and here comes this other thing and runs and, and we stop and they catch this big thing, this big bird thing and then whatever. And then they, we have a ceremony right there, a worship ceremony. That still road, that road is Sias's Road 96, okay. There's a road named after me in northern Malawi, yeah. It's amazing. But so, why am I telling this story? Because it's got absolutely no purpose. No, God sometimes takes you completely out of your comfort zone. And so eventually I realized like, wow, you know, because I had mass, massive issues with lots of stuff. And the, the Lord says to me, don't bring your culture into a relationship with me. Leave your culture at the door. And here we had this massive ceremony that evening because we could take an offering. That offering, that specific bird, opened up the heart of the chief of that tribe to eventually come to salvation. And I had massive issues. How can God provide like this? 
eventually that whole, that chief gave us land, lots of stuff. God turned that whole area around. But you know, it took me to actually come to a place of surrender. To say, Lord, I'm going to die. My greatest fear is happening right in front of me. And until you face that greatest fear, that's where the Holy Spirit wants to come in. That's where he wants to, where you need to learn to surrender. So a lot of people say, no, 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 you know, God doesn't work like that. God works like that. Because he first works in you to be able to work through you. This is the story of Pentecost. This is the story of following him, but it's the most exciting one. Will you stand with me tonight?